أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أسر الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فقد أرسلنا رسلنا بالبينات وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم ليقوم الناس بالقسط صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us this life and giving us the opportunity to be just because justice is the foundation with which everything comes to equilibrium you will notice that life is all about equilibrium. You'll notice even in the physical world, even in the chemical world, you have to bring things to equilibrium. You have to balance equations, otherwise things don't work right. <clears throat> it causes undue movements in the wrong direction necessarily. And the ultimate goal of everything is to bring everything towards equity, justice, balance. So Allah in the Quran, <coughs> Surah Al-Hadith, verse 57, I mean Surah 57, verse 25, Allah says, He sent messengers with clear arguments and sent down with them the book and the balance, the this. Because the balance is that what good is a messenger, what good is a prescription if it doesn't bring balance, if it doesn't bring equity, if it doesn't bring justice, if it doesn't bring harmony, what good is it? And Islam is at the forefront of the balance. It is at the forefront of bringing balance. Now, when we look at history, you will see that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam He brought balance in his region. If you look at the status quo of the time, um, tribes were killing each other. The tribes of Aws and Khazraj, for example, who were the tribes in Medina, they were constantly fighting with each other and killing each other. And they were constantly causing death to each other, to the extent that they were even counting the bones of their dead ones as a sign of their upper status. And it's when the verse in the Surah Takafir came, al hakum al takafir abundance has diverted you, because people were imbalanced. And there was so much killing that even highway robbers was so prevalent. Imagine in that period of time, if you needed to travel, you didn't know if you were robbed on your way or if you were stolen and taken as a slave, because that's how bad and lawless society it was. And then girls were considered second-class creations, and children, females that were born were buried alive. Fathers used to go and dig graves and take their daughters and bury them alive because it was supposedly an insult to have a female versus a male. I mean, look at the imbalance. It's unreal that our mothers are the females and we can't come into existence without them. And yet human society can tip the balance to such extreme levels that they willfully, a father willfully, takes a child, his own child, his own flesh and blood, and buries this child alive. I mean, I, I can't think about it. If I think about it, I think I would lose my sanity. And yet the human race is capable of doing that, willfully. When Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ الْتَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ This أَسْفَلَ سافلين, you and I are capable of doing that. You might say, no, the people of Mecca did that. The people of Arabia did that. No, we have the potential to do it too. But by the grace of Allah, and by the grace of society that Allah has created, we are not able to do so. And we are dissuaded from doing so. Because we can become very wretched beings. We can be very 
upright and lose our uprightness. There is no guarantee that you and I will die Muslim. There is no guarantee. You and I may say, no, I was born a Muslim, I'm going to die a Muslim. There is no guarantee. Any of us can say that, yes, yes, I'm going to die a believer. There is no guarantee. Promise. That's why Allah says, Ya ayyul insan, inna ka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi. O mankind, keep struggling upon struggle until you meet your Lord. Because if you stop struggling in the right direction, you don't know if you will be a Muslim. Even Yusuf السلام, after his great achievement of having become the advisor to the king of the time, and he became the inheritor of the entire treasury of Egypt. What does he pray? Look what Yusuf says. He says, you gave me this wealth. You taught me the art of interpretation. You are the master. You are the fashioner of the earth and sky. Let me die submissive and put me among the good. Here is a prophet who has achieved greatness to such levels that now his brothers, his father, a prophet, is bowing to him. And yet he says, Tawaffani Musliman. Let me die a Muslim. Who has guaranteed that we're going to die Muslim? Nobody. In our Christian world, they want to give us. In fact, many times I discuss with Christians, they say, see, the difference between you and me is I know I'm saved. You don't know if you're saved. I said, listen, I can fool myself, too. But I like to be honest. <laughs> I don't like fooling myself. I believe we're in the grace of God, and we are certainly put in a trajectory of being saved. And we're certainly not damned at birth, and we're certainly blessed at birth. But if we do not struggle, doesn't Jesus say, verily, verily, I say unto you, lest your deeds exceed those of the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of thy father. Isa alayhi salam in the Bible says, verily, verily, I say unto you, until your deeds are better than the Pharisees, of, meaning the Jews of the time were the troublemakers. Isa says, Un unless you're better than them, you will not enter paradise. Is it not deeds? And is it not that we struggle? So struggling is a healthy component. But you will notice that this imbalance in our transactions is what leads to chaos in society. It's what leads to bad management. It leads to bad leadership. It leads to destruction, loss, and pain and grief on this earth. When Allah said, We have created man in a state of trepidation. Kabad here in Arabic means liver. Liver is the most stressed organ in the human body. The most stressed organ in the human body is the liver. And it has to be constantly under stress. Allah says, you are like that. And then until and unless you realize the mission and the vision of why you were created, and to maintain a steady course while you try to create the best balance possible, you will cause harm and destruction in society. So Allah in this verse says, we sent messengers with them in a book, in a balance, that they may conduct themselves with equity. Mizan, Allah says. We gave you the Mizan, Allah's injunction in Surah Al-Rahman. It says, وَلَا تُخْسِرُوا mizan. Maintain the balance. Do not tilt the mizan. What is this mizan? These discussions and reflections within ourselves is to understand the mizan. So let me define justice as Imam Ali alayhi salam defines it. Salawat ala Muhammad Salawat Muhammad Imam Ali salam defines justice in a very simple way. Of course, there's much that he has discussed in Najul Balagha. But he says the simplest definition of justice is giving everything its proper due. Justice means giving everything its proper due. And Imam Ali salam says, I swear were you to allow me to unfold the seat of justice, meaning if you allow me to be the just, judge. I will not deny an insect the husk of its grain. Meaning the insect that deserves that one piece of grain, I will not deny that insect that grain. Giving everything its proper due. But you and I know that giving everything its proper due requires a great deal of understanding and knowledge, isn't it? 
This is why the world is so unjust, because the world primarily is lay and ignorant. And therefore we are unjust to each other because we're impulsive and we're emotional. And we have such low levels of confidence in ourselves and our understanding and the purpose of life is so transient and short-lived, we make others around us to suffer due to our short-term vision. This is why life is hell on earth, promise. Otherwise this earth is paradise. If you and I simply follow the prescriptions that Allah has enjoined upon us, this world will be the first paradise. The next one will be a better paradise, but this one will be the starting paradise. But unfortunately, because we disobey Allah so often, we cause harm on others because we don't give everything its proper due. And for us to give everything its proper due, we have to have understanding of everything to have its proper due. And the first fundamental rule of understanding the proper due is to put ourselves in the shoes of the other. Imam Ali Al -Islam gives beautiful advice to Imam Hassan. He says, my son, I have put myself in the shoes of the old man. I have not reached that age yet. But I have put myself in the shoe of the old person to try to understand the experience of this old person. So that I may understand and prepare myself in that direction and also to deal with the older generation according to what they deserve. See, when you and I are, they say, in, in <coughs> any kind of negotiation, if you want to be amicable, if you want to be just, put yourself in the shoe of the other and then pass the judgment. And you will see that it's a whole different perspective in how we judge. When we put ourselves in the shoe of the other, you will notice that it's a very different perspective. Otherwise, when we demand certain rights, just from our perspective, we don't realize that there is a broader side to the vision than ours. And often, as a result of that myopic view that it's my way or the highway, what we call this fundamental tunnel vision, pinhole vision of life, we cause destruction. Look at the ISIS group, Taliban, Sipai Sahaba, Lakshare, Jangwi in Pakistan. You look at all these extreme groups that butcher people, behead people. They have low tolerance for anyone other than their own ways. They're wicked, they're vicious, they're horrible people and they behead, they throw bodies off buildings, right? The, the Ibn Ziyad style, the Muawiyah style. Who are these people? If you look in their eyes, you will see they have myopia. They are so tunnel visioned. And this is what Shaitan wants them to be. And the messenger said, he said, the worst disease in society is ignorance. For it leads to myopic visions, which leads to destruction. Even the Khawarij, who broke away from Imam Ali's army in the Battle of Siffin, they were like that. They were so tunnel visioned. They were munafiqeen, as, Qur as Quran says, Imam Ali alayhi salam said, these are munafiqeen. These are the hypocrites. But there were three types of hypocrites Imam Ali alayhi salam exposes during his khilaf of four years and nine months. One group was this one. This one was myopic. Was so myopic that the modern day Khawarij is ISIS. Modern day Khawarij is the Taliban, Al Qaeda. This is the modern day Khawarij. You see how they work? They say Allahu Akbar when they shoot you. They have long beards, they pray. You see them praying and then they kill. Exactly what the Khawarij were doing in the time of Imam Ali is exactly what they're doing today. And the Khawarij were orchestrated by Muawiyah. Muawiyah financed the Khawarij. Muawiyah actually created the Khawarij. Muawiyah was slick and slippery. He manipulated the truth and twisted the truth and fooled people. Muawiyah was a master of fooling people. Honestly, you want to see a pathological liar who worked incessantly to fool and dupe the society? It was Muawiyah. There are people, sadly, in the world today, in the Muslim world, who revere him who honor him. In fact, in the Middle East, if you speak against Muawiyah, they come and say, hey, hey, don't speak against Muawiyah. In Dubai, one of our Shia scholars was speaking on the pulpit. 
They went to his hotel and told him, we don't want you speaking bad about Muawiyah. Can you imagine? No sane historian can dare give credit to Muawiyah as a man, a wretched man that he was. And yet when I do go to Masajid in khutbah of Jum'ah, I hear sometimes in this khutbah that they praise Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu. To me, that is the highest form of injustice. They say the throne of Allah shakes when tyrants are praised. The throne of Allah shakes. Throne meaning the, the haqq of Allah is with anger, khadr, when tyrants are praised. Today we have communities who still revere Muawiyah. You know why ISIS is doing what it's doing? It's the son of Muawiyah. It's the son of the Bani Umayyah. You want to see hell on earth? Even Congress has stated today, he says that is a vicious form of Islam. Even the non-Muslim has observed this. They said that Congress has made an interesting comment, and I'm not talking about Sunni Shia, but they have stated this. That the Shia are reasonable people. They are peace-loving people. They're not violent people. They're not extremists. They don't go killing and butchering the way these other groups are doing it. And I'm thinking, I said, yes, when you take the sunnah of Muawiyah, this is what you get. You see? We are the lovers of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wa salam. Why? Why do we love him? Because his name is Ali? No. We love him because he lived and died just. He was with the most high standards of justice. Up to the extent even his own brother Aqil who comes to him and says, give me a little from the treasury. He takes a hot iron and says, Aqil, you want me to get burnt on judgment day? That's the justice of Imam Ali alayhi salam. That the slave and the owners, the freed slaves and their owners, the previous owners, were all given the same amount of money from the treasury. And people came to him and says, you know the rich, these slave owners are now going to Muawiyah. Imam says, what do I need them for? They said, well, they are leaving you. He said, let them leave me. Allah did not send me to pander to them. Allah did not send me to become patrons to them. Allah sent me to be just and to be equitable. Look at the verse. Allah says, we send prophets with mizan, bilqist. We give lip service to the Quran and then we lean towards evil tyrant leaders. That leads to all kinds of hell on earth today. It's the same consequence. That we as a society, we claim to be Muslims, a religion of Mizan, and yet within our own groups of Islam, we cause so much hell and havoc. It's a contradiction that the messenger said, the one who will live the worst in hell is the one who preached and didn't practice. The one who proclaimed and was a liar. I had a Christian man meet me at the camp one day, first time, one of my... Uh, vendors that we were buying materials from. So as soon as I shook hands with him, he saw our camp at Camp Taha. He says, wow, this is beautiful. You're a Muslim camp. I said, yes. He says, so am I an infidel? First question he asked me, am I an infidel? So I said to him, that's an interesting question. It seems to be bothering you. He says, well, I hear in the media that we non-Muslims are infidels. So I'm asking you bluntly, straight to the point, am I an infidel? I says, infidelity is not outside of Islam necessarily. The worst form of infidelity is within Islam. So don't worry, take consolation, you're not an infidel. I say to him, a munafiq is one who pretends to be something but their heart is in the opposite direction, is the worst infidel in the Quran. The infidel that will be punished the most in the Quran is that one who preached and didn't practice. The one who presented himself in the garden, you know. We bear witness you are a prophet. Allah bears witness they are liars. Allah bears witness they are liars. This level of nifaq is the most dangerous. I call this the Trojan horse theory. See, Troy was destroyed because of the Trojan horse. Right? What is that? The Trojan horse penetrates the inside walls. No one is a greater enemy to Islam than the Muslims. And the levels of nifaq within Islam causes more damage and harm than outside. And those who are 
mechanically controlling the Muslim world could not have done it unless the Muslim, those Munafiqeen Muslim, within Islam, opened the doors to the enemy. Otherwise, from within Islam, Islam is in Muslims. If they practice Islam, it's indomitable. Nobody can destroy Muslims. Impossible. Unless you and I sell our souls to the devil. The hell that we went through in history, even with Muawiyah's Khilafah, you notice the echoes of that Khilafah continues until today. Where you have kings, Khadim al Haramain, having palaces galore. Their wealth is immeasurable. Stolen wealth, not theirs. Who put them there? With due respect, it's the British Empire that put them there. The British Empire put the Sauds today. The Sauds are the modern day Muawiyahs. The Muawiyah of then was they created the Khawarij and they financed it. The Muawiyahs of today also finance it. And they create bombs, they blow people up every day, they blow up massages, they blow up Muslim communities all over the place. And the Western media sits on the sidelines and says, look at these Muslims, they're killing each other. Look at these foolish people. Look how their religion promotes violence. Look, terrorism equals Islam, Islam equals terrorism. See that? Because we gave them that ability. So the question is, you and I who understand this, what do we do to stop this madness? First and foremost, let's get educated and let's be firm and resolute in our pathways. Because if there's one thing the Muawiyahs and the Yazids and the Shayateen of the world they don't like is when you and I have resolutions. When you and I are firm in resolution, they get bothered. If we're wishy-washy and ever so willing to become chameleons and to change our colors, they like us because we're always for sale. All you have to do is just throw some money and we'll be sold. Like Imam Hassan wasalam, when he went to fight Muawiyah, the day he was starting the battle, half the army of Imam Hassan was already bought by Muawiyah the night before. That kind? You know what shocks me? Is when you are in the presence of the Ahlul Bayt, you will not find humans greater than them. How is it people can sell their souls after seeing in the flesh the representatives of Allah? So what about you and me? We haven't seen them. What about you and me? You and me, you think we're firm? Imam Ali salam, had very few friends. A man who killed giants. He was unafraid. He was so balanced that when he killed Amr bin Abd, Amr bin Abd would, in the battle of the ditch, when Imam Ali killed him, he was the epitome of kufr. You know, Amr bin Abd was a giant. Was a giant on the battlefield. And he used to fight with jewels on his armor. You don't usually put jewels on your armor. Because if you get defeated, you lose the jewels. But he was so confident no one could defeat him, he had jewels on his armor. He was so wealthy with his jewels. Yet when Imam kills him, he doesn't take his armor. It is his right to take it. According to Islamic law, it is your right to take it. It becomes your property. Imam leaves it. The sister commented that as much as I'm sad that my brother has been killed, I am honored that a great human being killed him. Imam Ali That's his justice system, that he leaves it. He does, he's showing to the people, I did not fight this man for his jewels. I fought for haq. How many of us can do that? Yet in his time, he had very few friends, very few. Very few companions that he could hold hands and talk to. I, my spine shivers at the thought that when Imam Sahib Zaman والسلام, comes back. Muhammad. That how will I um, how will I behave? How will I behave? Will I be his friend? You know what's the guarantee pretty much? There's no guarantee, by the way, but the closest to guarantee is to constantly have intadar. Intadar in practical ways. The Messenger says, Afdalul ibadah 
انتظار المهدي One of the best ibadah is the intadar of al-Mahdi. Now tonight and these subsequent nights I'm speaking about social justice, the importance of social justice, and why you and I must stop contributing to social injustice. And there are practical means to do so. Very simple, but they work. But I'm exposing the outcome of social injustices at its peak. And I'm explaining about ISIS and the mechanisms. And you find that even Mu'awi, by the way, just as a quick footnote, was also not alone. He was being orchestrated by the other religions of his neighbors. Heraclius, the Christian Empire, the Jewish Empire, they were also with him. And they were nudging him, and he was the financier, and then the Khawarij went and did the dirty work. What's different then than now? No difference. Today, the same thing. The orchestration is from the United Nations. The orchestration is from other nations. And you've got this oil-rich country financing the destruction. It's an irony when I speak at the universities in America. I said in America we have the Patriot Act, which implies that we have low tolerance for anyone who promotes terrorism. And in academia, I ask this question. I said, as an American citizen, I totally agree with that. In fact, I pray as an American citizen, whoever did 9-11, may God destroy them in this world and in the next. I pray, ilahi ameen, because I know who's done it. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether a Muslim did it or a non-Muslim. Whoever causes destruction on any human being should be punished. That's unequivocal, isn't it? But I say we have a low tolerance for the promotion of terrorism. Look at the hypocrisy of the political world. Even at Harvard when I spoke, I said, you want us to educate our children, and you want us to promote education. Then why don't we all come on the same platform and denounce outright hypocrisy in the geopolitical world so that our next generation does not get confused with what is right versus what is wrong? I said, our number one airline in the Middle East, besides Israel, is the kingdom of Saudi-occupied Arabia. And they are financing all of this terrorism, and we are the best allies with them. Don't you think we should sever relations with them? It's not a secret that the funding that's coming is coming from them. It's not a secret. So then why are we such close friends with them? It's because it's not about justice. It's not about equity. It's not about, it's about power, hegemony, and an enemy of an enemy is a friend. That injustice, our prophets and imams categorically did not follow. They rejected it. As a result, what's coming out from the United Nations is mass chaos on earth. You look at the Rohingyans being killed, nobody's raising. Rwandans are being killed, a million of them got killed, no one raised a finger. Charlie Hebdo, Hmm? The hypocrisy of Charlie Hebdo, when he say, a man who was working for Charlie Hebdo made a comment about Sarkozy's son becoming a Jew. He got fired, and no one's saying anything about freedom of speech. It's amazing. And all the world leaders come to France and stand and say, yes, we shall. MashaAllah. How much justice do you have? This double standard hypocrisy reeks. And it brings the hell on earth. But we must educate our next generations and tell them this is what is the bala. The bala, the, the machinery of the Mu'awiyahs of the time. You know how Mu'awiyah was good in creating machinery of media? The CNNs and the Foxes of today? The confused network newses of today? You know what he, he did? When Imam Ali salam was martyred in the masjid, in the state of Sujood, the common Syrian said, Ali ibn Abi Talib prayed. How could he be struck in Sujood? He was praying. That's how Muawiyah created the vision of Ahlul Bayt among the Syrians. That when Imam Zain al-Abidin enters, and he enters the palace of Yazid, and he climbs up the pulpit and he speaks, the revolution of Imam Hussein was in full swing because he entered the belly of the beast to now to eradicate the falsities of Muawiyah's creation which brought down the Umayyad Empire. And until today, 
It has never regained its strength, but it took on different colors, and today it continues the machinery of shaitan, but our imam is asking us, Hal min nasirin yansuruna. I went to Karbala, and I gave my soul and my family, so you, my followers, can understand this evil. How have you allowed it to dominate? Salat ala Muhammad wa so how do we answer this question? Look, I'm, being ex I'm exposing some of these basic elements of the reality of the world so that you and I understand that when we hear in the media vilifications of Islam and in Islam is being denounced and Muslims are being put down, don't say, oh, you see, there is something wrong with Islam. What's wrong with us? Can we Sunni and Shia get together? At Harvard, they were saying, can you Sunni and Shia get together? Excuse me. We've always been together. It's the instigations of the outside and from within the Trojan horse of the vocal minority that has caused this dispute. Otherwise, between Sunni and Shia, we are 98% similar. Back off. We are very similar to Christians and Jews, for your information. Did you know that? Islam is very similar to Judaism and Christianity. In many principles, we are almost identical. Does it mean we kill each other? I said Protestants and Catholics kill each other between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, right? Between Southern Ireland and Northern Ireland, respectively. They kill each other. But who's instigating that? Us Muslims are not from the back end instigating, sending armies to divide you and to conquer you, as the colonials of Europe did. All the colonials of Europe, when they divided the world to themselves, the Europeans are the biggest land thieves on earth. They divided the whole world for themselves because they are the poorest continent on earth. Of the seven continents on earth, Europe is the poorest resource continent on earth. Did you know that? So they went and carved out. You know how they carved it? They carved it by dividing and conquering. Making every group fight with the other group. Civil war. You see when the colonials left their, those nations that they colonized, go to every one of them, you'll see civil war continues until today. Why is that? Are we all just genetically bent and we are just carved in being pugnacious and being constantly fighting and all the time just killing each other? Or is it that they left the poison pill between us to ensure that we never get our act straight because they figured out that if they cannot colonize us with the hand, they'll do it from distance. So let's wake up and rise to the occasion and say, any form of colonization, whether it's a Muslim against a non-Muslim or vice versa, is wrong. The human race must be given the opportunity to live equitably with justice and dignity on earth, between and within their own cultures and their own rights. Do we appreciate that? Well, I say today, the world suffers. And I'll read Surah Hujurat today, just on the gist, and you will see, you will see where this is all taking us. You'll see the principles have been forgotten, and the world doesn't even know this. I don't blame the world. I swear I don't blame the world. When I walk around in the, on the streets and I see people talking, even when somebody bashes Islam, I don't blame them. I say, you're probably a product of media, and media has consistently told you this lie, and you are just simply echoing what you're hearing. Even if I was in your shoes, I'd be doing the same thing. It's because we, as a Muslim community, the erudites of society, the learned community of the world, the chosen people of the world, I swear, because we have been chosen with the Quran, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge, with Salah, with Ahlul Bayt, with Rasulullah, we're given. Nobody's got it. And I travel the world and I see we're just keeping it within our pockets. Like God has chosen us, like the Jews, that we're chosen people of the world and we're all going to paradise and the rest is going to hell. Whereas Allah says, Ya ayu ladhina haadu in za'amtum annakum awliyaaw lillahi min dunin nas, fatamannaw al-mawt in kuntum sadaqeen. Wa la yatamannawnahu abadam bima qaddamat aydi. Wallahu alimun bil-dhaad. You Jews, you claim to be chosen people of the world? Allah says, no problem. I have no problem in selecting you as the chosen people. Being chosen is a gift of God. No one says you should not be chosen. My philosophy is we're all chosen. Who isn't chosen? Black, white, brown, yellow, tall, short, rich, poor. Who is not chosen? Tell me. The condition in the Quran is you are chosen, but there's a condition. 
tamanna al-maut. Have a desire towards me. Be willing to sacrifice for me. Be just, be equitable, be caring, be sharing, giving and forgiving. Do so, you are chosen. Tatamanna al-maut. It doesn't matter you're black or white. Today, even within our Muslim communities, how do we discriminate and look against each other? Unreal, isn't it? I tell you the fundamental principle shaitan used when he fell from grace and when Adam was created, shaitan realized this creature has come in my way and that jealousy continues to drive him towards damnation and he's using one mechanism when he said by your authority I will beguile them it comes under the principles of divide and conquer if there's one sickness we have in society, it's discrimination. Us versus them. And swift damnation of everyone else. It's the only way to protect my interests. I must damn you. If you're not with me, you're weird. You don't follow my marja, you're a kafir. I've seen people say, haram to eat your food. Why? Oh, because you don't follow my marja. I said, are you serious? To that level, yes. Some people, myopia is within Islam too. Even among the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we have prevalence of myopia within our community. Ignorance galore. This causes all kinds of problems in society. So let's establish here. Fundamental principle, what does the Quran teach me in this blessed month of Ramadan? On how do I bring social justice? How do I become an individual that brings equity? The type where Aus and Khazraj were killing each other. You know who became the galvanizing point of Aus and Khazraj? That became the Ansar of Rasulullah, the helpers of Rasulullah. The Prophet loved them so much, he gave himself to them. He was the galvanizing agent. He became the bridge. Aus and Khazraj shook hands that the Prophet is our guiding light. And the Jews were disappointed. The Jews at the time in Medina didn't like that. Because that's how they were controlling us in Khalid. That's how they were ruling them. And when the messenger came in the way, and he united them and brought equity and balance, and the people, the, think about it, brothers. People of Aus and Khazraj were so vicious, they used to butcher families left, right, and center. These are the same people. Within a short time, when the messenger came in their way, and they took the messenger wholeheartedly. They were so good that when the Muhajir migrated from Mecca to Medina, they wanted to leave their inheritance to them. They used to feed the Muhajir. They used to house the Muhajir. They loved the Muhajir so much. The Muhajirs were the ones who migrated from Mecca to Medina. It means they were, they were what we call ghuraba. You know, they were wayfarers. They were travelers. They loved them so much that they said, our inheritance, we want to give a part of it. And Allah reveals a verse, no, that's too much. You are too good with that. It's not your obligation to give them your inheritance. See? But notice, the same wretched people become so God conscious and so good, it's possible because we have rahmatun lil alameen. Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So first rule, brothers and sisters, we as a Muslim Ummah, five schools of thought major. Even if you take the Ahmadis into the, into, and the Ismailis and the Dawudis, you will notice that the central figure in Islam is Rasulullah. We as Muslims should unite with each other on the basis of Allah and Rasulullah. On the basis that we believe in God. On the basis that the Kaaba is our Qibla. On the basis that the Holy Prophet is our Prophet. When I sit with my Sunni brethren from the communities of Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, and Hanbali groups, I said, Rasulullah is our galvanizing point. We do not differentiate each other when it comes to our love for Rasulullah, isn't it? So let's unite with Rasulullah. The way Aus and Khazraj was united with Rasulullah. That peace and equity becomes the harmonious method. But the enemy today doesn't want it. 
In Saudi, you know, Saudi Arabia, and imagine this name, Saudi, it's the only nation in the modern time which was robbed and named by a family, to a family. The other person who did that was King Philip of Spain, when he took the Isles, you know, and calls it Philippines. Today in Saudi Arabia, there was a man who wanted to pray with the Sunni and the Shia. He was flogged. He was beaten in public because he introduced the idea of wahda, unity. Because shaitan said, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأَغْوِيَنْهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ By your authority, I will beguile them. How? Divide them. Conquer them. Break them into parts. Because if they're united, they come towards you. This is why you notice the Muslims of Medina were so successful in maintaining the forces of defense against the Meccans because they were united. In the Battle of Badr, the Muslims unanimously, three to one, Imagine there were three times as many enemies as one Muslim, yet they defeated the people of Mecca. Why? Because in unity, as we, when we're united, we're indomitable. But shaitan doesn't want our unity. You come to our Islamic centers today within the Shia community, you got five, six, ten centers in the community. Do you think they all work together? Outwardly, maybe a little bit. Go deep down and listen to their gossip from one group against the other. Each side tries to bash the other. And they feel there's a sense of loyalty if you don't come. If you don't come to my place, you're not loyal to me. This sense of loyalty. What happened to loyalty for Allah? What happened to loyalty for Islam? This is why we're so divided. I promise us, we're so divided at this level, and it goes to the nth level, within our families, within our natures, in our cultures, in our economic status. Allah says, be vigilant of these divisive mechanisms and hold on with justice and equity. So Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah number 49, Allah says, He starts with, listen to the principles of the Qur'an. This is why I love the Qur'an, cover to cover. The Qur'an is a book of morals. It's a book of principles. It's not a story book. It's not a science book. It's got all of the above. But it's a book of morals. A book of principles. It teaches me how to traverse the complicated lifestyles in maintaining justice and equity. He says, Ya ladina amanu, la tuqaddimu bayna yidayillahi wa rasooli. Wattaqullah, inna allaha sami'un alim. How powerful. <coughs> Fundamental principle of the 49th chapter. All you who believe, do not go forward in the presence of Allah and the Messenger. Do not go forward. Forward in what sense? Do not put them as secondary tertiary beings. Keep them primary in your life. It's like a corporation. You sit in a boardroom and somebody's making a comment. And somebody who's making a comment does not have the jurisdiction to do so. And the chairman of the board says, excuse me, you have stepped your boundaries. You cannot do so. When somebody steps the boundaries, they're in violation of the core principles of governance. Simple. Quran is saying, do you believe Allah is your Lord? He says, yes. Do you believe the messenger is the ultimate role model, the ultimate prophet, the ultimate guide? That Allah says, "An Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim." The prophet has greater right on the believers than the believers have on themselves. Do you agree? We do. Allah says, "La tuqaddimu bayn idillahi wa rasuli." This is often lip service. Rasulillah, lip service. Push him aside. Let's talk about everything else. It's like the Christians. Christ died for my sins. Put him aside. Let's go to Paul. So who asked you to go to Paul? Christ is your way. Pray like him. Fast like him. Live like him. No, 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 no. He died only for my sins. Everything else is not important. Isn't that the same with us? How often do we take lessons from the Holy Prophet and say, my Prophet wanted this. Often when I sit with my young brothers and sisters, sometimes there's a Sharia issue that comes about and we say, oh, Marja X says, you know, it's mustahab. This one says it's makro. Gray area. But the stuff that they're doing, like smoking shisha, for example. I'm very anti-shisha, FYI. In my opinion, it's bad for your health. It's deleterious. Hubble bubble is bad. It's ugly. And I don't care what anybody says. And I ask them a basic question. Can you see the Holy Prophet holding it? The guy holding it? Says, no. I said, what are you doing holding it? Oh, brother, that's a prophet. You're, you're, you're equating too much now. <laughs> so suddenly the prophet has to go to the mantelpiece. You know, put him on the side. 
Profit is only for lip service. Hello, not for these transactions of day to day. You don't bring the profit here. Please, profit is way above there. Exactly what Shaitan says. Why do you need the profit? Praise him all you want. Praise Allah all you want. Then put him on the side. So you ask the brother, could you see the prophet? He says, well, the prophet, there was no shisha at that time. I said, true, but the Prophet says, Awaluna Muhammad wa awsatuna Muhammad wa akhiruna Muhammad wa kulluna Muhammad. So Imam Mahdi alayhi salatu wa sallam is Muhammad. Could you see him in our modern times? He says, no. I said, okay, then my advice to you, you don't need to go to a Malji and ask the ruling. You already know it. See how convenient it is for us to twist the rules. Now people say, oh brother, you're so vocal about it. I said, I'm vocal not because I want to be vocal. Because when you study it scientifically, you will see it is extremely harmful. It's sometimes more dangerous than 10 cigarettes per, per puff. But do we care? It's a culture. In some countries, you pick up the phone and 30 seconds later, some guy's got a nice lit unit and bringing it for you free of charge. Right? Free service. But people say, oh, you're being too vocal. Yeah, why should I not be vocal? If it's harmful for the body, especially for this young generation, I never want this young generation ever holding this substance. I don't care if the older generation holds it. I never want them holding this because it's harmful. And if I care for my society, then I must be vocal about it. And if that means that I'm going to be marginalized by the society hmm, and be called names, I don't care. Because when I go six feet down, Allah will ask me, what did you do? So, how about weed? Marijuana. Today it's become popular. Medicinal. Good for you. Yeah, yeah, you know that. Marijuana is oh, good for you. You know, if you have uh, convulsions and. Oh, it calms you down. So cool. You got all kinds of them. Ones that speed you up, ones that slow you down. It's a whole potpourri of them, you know? It's like a fashion. Arena, which color do you want, which brand do you want? You know, tetrahydrocannabinol, which is THC, which is the substance found in weed, shrinks the human brain. It causes the human brain to shrink. It makes you more stupid. It reduces your IQ. And it makes you addicted. And it actually leads to schizophrenia, probably. You, you know, you see vision. So, yet we find in our society, our young generations in communities smoking as they get together. Why? It's an imbalance. Who has introduced this idea? There are people out there making a lot of money in this business. And our young generations are being destroyed. So Allah SWT is saying, لا تقدموا بين الله ورسوله. Could you see your Prophet doing this? Could you see Ahlul Bayt doing it? Could you see our women in Ahlul Bayt doing this? No. Allah says, then why do you believe in them? Are they just lip service for you? Or do you believe in them by making concerted efforts on a daily basis with which to follow their footsteps? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing a beautiful example, and I end this within the next few minutes. You find that Allah shows me a history. By the way, the Quran is highly contextual. When the Quran was revealed, I just want to introduce this, I'll discuss it further. The 114 chapters of the Quran are expressions of reality. Please understand that. The universe has a reality without words. It's real. It's like when you love someone, and someone says, how much do you love this person? Says, I can't explain it. It's real. What's that real aspect? But I can't put it in words. But it's real. Well, the expression of that real is the Quran. It's words in reality. Please understand that. And our obligation is to read the Quran to get the reality. And so Allah says, illa al None can touch it save the purified ones. Because it's so real, unless you are purified, you can't touch the real essence of the Quran. But we, as the average human being, can touch the Quran in words, in the sense of reading it, to understand it, to get near it, to get closer to reality. And it is a book conformable and designed for even the lay to understand. Quran is a very simple book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Quran al dhikr fahal mimmuddakir. Surah al four times Allah says, we have made the Quran 
easy to remember. Who will pay need? So the Quran is contextual. It's contextual and it is many times verses come depending on the situation of the Prophet's event. Why did that happen? Why did the Quran just not come from the sky in a book and the Prophet just gets it and he delivers to the people? Because Islam is an action religion. It's a religion built with the reality of our existence. And it's so contextual that Allah wants me to understand the context of my life through analogies and through events historically to make sense of what does it really mean. So, quick introduction. When Islam was growing and in Medina, many tribes were becoming Muslims. Some of the companions of the Prophet who did not really consider the Prophet with the dignity that he deserved because they went ahead of Allah and the Prophet. That's why Allah says, Ya la wa rasul. Do not go ahead. What they did was they went ahead. You and I many times go ahead because we give lip service to the Prophet, but then we don't show respect for him. So Allah says, you're also going ahead. So what happened is that people were coming to do shahada and these companions started talking to each other on how they're going to welcome. And they started getting annoyed with each other and they were raising their voices when the Prophet is standing there. I want you to take a snapshot for a second. The Prophet is standing next to these companions and this is the man who emancipated ignorance. This is the man who talks to God all the time. This is the man who the universe was created for. You know, you can't find a man like that. Today I find important people, I, I shiver when I'm standing next to them. And I can't even lift my eyes because I'm, I'm so in awe of the presence of this great scholar. You cannot compare such thoughts to the Holy Prophet because he's even higher. He's standing there and they're arguing as to what to do on how to bring the Muslim, the, the, the future Muslims into the fold of Islam. Like as if he's not important. Like as if we don't need you anymore, Prophet. You can stand here, we'll decide. Because we are just so natural leaders, we don't need you anymore. So the verse comes down. Ya ladina amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi wa la tajharu lahu bil qawli ka jahri ba'dikum li ba'din an tahbata a'malukum wa antum la tashru. All you who believe, do not raise your voices in front of the messenger. That perchance one against you, that your deeds get wiped out, your good deeds, and you won't even see it. What does Allah say? If you even dare to go ahead of the messenger, your good deeds get wiped out. Good deeds, they get wiped out. Exactly. So this is what happened. What is this? This is the principles of justice. Principles of justice is pegged. The principles are pegged on the belief, proper belief of Tawheed and Rasulullah. I even talk to Christians, Jews, atheists out there. They all love justice. But nobody can hit bullseye but you and I. Because we know the proper structure of governance. That when Allah is put into, fo into focus, and the best human being is placed in position as my guide, justice will prevail. But when we do not follow that, hell becomes obvious. So what happened is, they raise their voices. Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَغُضُّونَ أَسْوَاتُمْ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهِ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلْتَّقْوَةِ Those who lower their voices in front of the messenger, these are the ones we test them with piety. How? They have their structure in right order. I end with this tonight. That may Allah give us the tawfiq. That while we are growing up as Muslims, we go home, we say, Oh Allah, you and my Prophet are the ultimate guide. And everything I do from now onwards, including my business, my education, whatever I do in the world, whatever, I do it for you. And I unequivocally refuse to bargain that principle. Watch what happens. If we do it as a society, our backbiting will stop, our harming will stop, our love for humanity will increase, our justice will become better, will become more balanced, and our mizan will be more established. I'll discuss 
the practical methods of Surat al Hujarat in transactions on how to bring social justice. And you will see, you will see that holistically, if you and I simply focus on these principles, I promise us we will be a better society than yesterday. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma inna nagharu ilayka fi dawlatin kareema tu'izzu biha al-Islam wa ahla wa tu'zillu biha al-Nifaq wa ahla wa taj'alna fiha min al-du'ati la ta'ati wa al-qadati la sadilik wa tarzuquna biha karamat al-dunya wa al-akhirah Rabbana aghfir lana wa al-ikhwanina al-lazina sabakuna bil-iman wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghillan al-lazina amanu Rabbana innaka ra'ufur rahim wa akhir al-da'un alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. <تصفيق> 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 <تصفيق>